श्री राहुल बजाज श्री दिवेटिया मंदाबेन मेंबर्स ऑफ प्रोफेसर रामलाल परिक्स फैमिली मेंबर्स ऑफ द इंडियन सोसाइटी फॉर कम्युनिटी एजुकेशन डिस्टिंग्विश इनवाइटीज लेडीज एंड जेंटलमैन आई कंसिडर इट एज ए ग्रेट प्रिविलेज दैट आई एम इन योर मिथ्स टूडे and i am grateful to the indian society for community education to give me this opportunity to pay my tributes and respects to the late professor ramlal parikh he was an icon a legendary figure a true son of india <laughs> and uh, i am overwhelmed at uh, being given this opportunity and the big bonus was uh, the opportunity to listen to rahul ji i had heard that he is charismatic and uh, i got an opportunity to experience it myself so thank you very much i don't think that uh, it is a great idea that after such a memorable memorial lecture uh you ask someone else to speak about uh, the subject however that is what has been suggested and uh, i will try to put across briefly a few points which is basically uh, reiterating and in extension of what uh, rahul ji has uh, so eloquently described first of all i think the best way to pay tribute to ramlal bhai was to talk on the subject which was so dear to his heart which is talking about the government society and look at both from the angle of business now if you if you look at the the dreams and the vision of the people who struggled for achieving independence of this nation and the kind of dream of india that they had when uh, the freedom struggle was on and prepare our performance score card mm. 60 years down the line mm. there are going to be some achievements and several disappointments mm. and uh, i think one needs to look at this relationship between government business and society from that angle i mean you know that that let us let us let us look at what is it that gandhi ji visualized ramlal bhai visualized and whole lot of leaders who contributed to the foundation of independence uh, had sought and uh, rahul ji towards the concluding part of his uh, lecture pointed out that why is it that you know we are trying to talk about our legitimate place in the world economy now let us remember that 2000 years back india was a superpower in the in the world i mean we were the torch bearers we were the leading light of the world in every sphere whether it was economic or social or education you look at any dimension and we were the world leaders we were the thought leaders of the world today 
we are struggling <laughs> at the bottom of that pyramid <laughs> and trying to find our way to the top. And the only silver lining is that there are many who tell us that maybe 20, 30 years down the line, we would achieve our rightful place in the global economy. Now, we cannot blame the lack of independence for everything. You know, the, that we were ruled by others and so on and so forth. And it is in that context that we must evaluate what we have achieved in 60 years. And as uh, Rahul Ji very rightly said, I think uh, despite all economic progress, we have still not succeeded in uh, eliminating poverty. Percentage-wise, we may say that maybe 27-28% of the country's population is below the poverty line, but number-wise, the number of poor has increased. 300 million is a staggering number. I mean, you know, and uh, the estimates are about that, regardless of whatever disputes you, you may have about methodology. And I think it is time that both the businesses and the government recognize that their interface with the society is, will have to take into account this fact that there are 300 million poor who live in this country. It is not possible to bypass them. Businesses can't simply discard them as people who don't have purchasing power and therefore is not a relevant segment of the market. I mean, you know, that, that, that's not the kind of philosophy that... The whole need for philanthropy and corporate social responsibility arises from the fact that through your products, you are doing precious little to target this segment of the market anyway. What is it that you are doing for the plight of the poor? Now let us understand that, and the government must also recognize that the true indicator of economic development is not necessarily the GDP growth. But at the end of the day, what difference you make to the quality of the life of the poor is what is going to determine where the nation is going to go. I think it is commonplace to blame or transfer the responsibility for our failures to a whole lot of things, you know, whether you talk about corruption or whether you talk about the ills of democracy or whether you talk about the, the kind of equations that develop and so on. But at the end of, at the root of all that, let us understand that it is our failure to tackle this fundamental problem. Mm. Your constitution guarantees all kinds of things. Mm. But some of the things that the constitution guarantees can only be achieved through governance, mm. the quality of governance. And, and, and that is where I think the, the government uh, matters. Uh, and this is not a question of sloganizing these things. I mean, you just cannot say, Garibi Hatao, you know, so that's fine. I mean, you know, uh, it sounds like a very catchy phrase when the elections are around the corner. <laughs> but uh, what happens after you get elected, that is what matters, you know. And, and it is here where there is a lot that can be done through a partnership between the business and the government. And uh, I think without that, we are, we are not going to be able to solve many of the problems uh, that, that arise. Let me also highlight that after independence for practically three and a half, four decades, we were an excessively regulated and excessively governed society. I mean, you know, there were, uh, there, was an, there were too much of uh, governance, there was too much of regulation, there were too many controls and so on and so forth. And Rahulji very rightly pointed out the problems that, uh, and the kind of mindset that businesses developed as a consequence of that. Forget about the mindset of the bureaucracy and the government, but the mindset that developed in the, 
and uh, he, in his own style described you know uh, how licenses were obtained and licenses were preempted <laughs> and uh, you know what consequences uh, all of these caused now then came the economic reforms and liberalization on a very large scale of trade and industry <laughs> now in this era of liberalization and economic reforms massive growth has taken place and uh, we are seeing the fruits of all that all over the place but somewhere during the process of economic development that followed the liberalization there is somewhere a disconnect between investment and employment the link has uh, weakened huge growth of investment has not resulted in a commensurate growth of employment there has also been a disconnect between growth of turnover and growth of employment <laughs> i mean you know regardless of which parameter you use and somehow there has also been a disconnect between the growth of profits and the contribution to the society that the businesses have made now let us understand that all tasks of social development cannot be left to the government because the government has limited ability to govern <laughs> and the government has limited resources as well and as he very rightly said that at least 1% uh, should be earmarked for this ideally speaking it should be better than that but then something is better than nothing so uh, i mean you know uh, in, in in that spirit uh, one should take it but even there let me tell you that what appears on paper and what actually happens in practice there is a gap i mean many organizations can show 1% contribution on paper <laughs> but in actual practice uh, there are ways and means in which uh, the effective expenditure uh, does not uh, amount to that and uh, i think these are issues that uh, we need to address let me <coughs> very quickly come to the other important thing that uh, rahul ji said and that is about uh, you know the socialism that we practice for many i think he's absolutely right and i agree with him that socialism in this country has very often been used as a pretext to allow vested interest groups to reap private benefits basically i mean you know so this is and and, and that is the worst form uh, of of socialism that uh, Uh, it is a socialism for the masses which effectively implies capitalism for a few <laughs> and uh, i think uh, it is that and i don't think that you have to see far and wide in order to get even the physical evidences of what i'm saying <laughs> you know the the best known uh, advocacies of uh, the indigenous approach uh where you talk about what happens to you your own things uh most of them are either studying or employed abroad i mean you know if you if you talk about the kith and kin so i think this uh, is 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 a phenomenon uh, that uh, one has to worry about sometimes people say you know that if your goals are noble if your objectives are uh, noble then uh, you know everything is justified but i frankly believe that ends never justify the means and let us not forget that <laughs> and i think socialism which is giving dignity and equality in terms of quality of life to masses is a very noble goal <laughs> but that doesn't justify the kind of means uh, that we end up uh, using now i also agree with rahul ji on one thing which is uh, he very vividly said and i think there has been lot of debate on this which is that uh, our country 
the kind of democracy in a federal structure that it is, is always in a state of perpetual elections, you know. Uh, that uh, there is hardly any year that passes when six, seven, eight states don't go to polls. And uh, by the time the cycle of states is completed, you have general elections. And therefore, every six to eight months, uh, you have elections. Earlier, we didn't realize this. Now, in this era of 24-hour uh, news channels, you, you suddenly see that, you know, every six months uh, there is election analysis uh, and, you know, th those kinds of things which are, which are going on. Now, this is not a good thing. I mean, it is a waste of huge amount of resources and also the attention and time of those who are managing the country. And so it's a very good idea to synchronize the state and the national uh, elections. And uh, therefore, you have one government, and then for four years, you govern, <laughs> right? I mean, you know, you, you, you actually deliver results, because then only accountability, uh, in the true sense of the term, can be, can be fixed. In this respect, I would like to observe one thing, that one reason why the economic liberalization has produced tangible results in the business, corporate sector, is that in most large business houses today, the people who managed businesses in the regulated era and the people who are managing businesses today, the generation has changed. And it is this younger generation which has taken over has ensured that the transition has been smoother than what would have been otherwise. The same thing does not apply to politics. <laughs> now, that is where the problem is. You know, in most parties and most regions, the older generation of leadership is still dominant. And that is why the adjustment uh, is becoming a more difficult process. I mean, I'm Rahul ji, since he's so candid, so I thought that, uh, you know, let me uh, just add this part to it. Now, let me, uh, let me conclude uh, by saying that as far as the government is concerned, we are facing a very serious danger. The current global financial crisis hmm. is most likely to be used as a very strong excuse for increasing the degree of regulation. Hmm. Now, there are nations where the regulation was given a vacation, you know, and, 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 and therefore uh, one, can, one can have something. But in India, for instance, we have a reasonable degree of regulation already in place. That is what has saved us. Now, the current situation should not be used to reintroduce excessive controls and regulations. I think we have the right regulation in place. What is required is a implementation of this with all fairness. I mean, you know, so that is what, uh, what the country needs. But I see the danger that, uh, you know, we may use this as an excuse to revert to the older situation and reverse the process of reforms and liberalization, and that is not warranted at all. And let me conclude by talking about the situation in the business. I think Rahulji very rightly pointed out that profit is not a dirty word, certainly not. I mean, that nobody argues that profit is a dirty word. But the only thing that people say is that profit, yes, but not at any cost. Hmm. I mean, you need to think about the wider implications of what you do for the society. Business ethics. Hmm. It is very often said that business ethics should be a compulsory subject in all business schools. Well, it is. Hmm. I mean, you know, let me, uh, let me make it very clear. Because if you make it an elective, hardly anybody will take it. <coughs> so that's why it is a compulsory subject. Uh, 
but then the issue is that it is not see we train managers but the managers go and work in an environment in an organization now ethics is not a subject of prophecy it is a matter of practice and practice flows from the top and I think that is where uh, there is a need for the businesses to reduce the gap between what is preached or what is projected and what is actually practiced. I think there is a lot of verbosity about ethics. What is required is some action as far as ethical practices are concerned. And uh, as Rahul just said, he's an optimist. I'm also an optimist. And I believe that times will come when both governments and businesses will realize this, not only realize this, but will start practicing it. And if that happens, then uh, we would have brighter days ahead of us. And the economic progress of this nation will translate into true national development of India as a nation. And we will probably be back at the same place that we were 2,000 years ago. Thank you very much.